Well, hello everybody and welcome to Stokeford Parish Midweek Online. Uh, we are going to be continuing today uh, in our series in Nehemiah and Peter Wenham is going to be speaking on the next part of chapter 2 from our service yesterday on Tuesday morning. Uh, but before that, a bit of a notice about Harvest, which is coming up this Sunday. Uh, if you would like to bring produce and uh, give to our food bank, uh, there are a few things that we need, and I'll tell you about those in a minute. But drop-off times, if you could come to church to drop off uh, between 10 and 12 on Saturday, the church will be open then uh, to drop off produce. And if you're coming along to our services, uh, either at 10 in the morning or 6.30 in the evening, you can drop it off then as well. Uh, but if you're not booked into one of those, uh, the church will be available for drop-off from 9.30am on Sunday morning and from 6pm for the evening service um, to drop off then as well. Uh, and if you come to the Tuesday service, do bring some things along there, uh, that's absolutely fine. And then from that point afterwards, uh, drop anything that you may have picked up uh, in at the church office. Uh, but you might be thinking, what sort of things to bring or what do we need this year? Well, I can tell you we've got plenty of baked beans. Uh, but a few things that we really could be doing with, we could do some rice puddings, tinned potatoes, long life milk, meat paste, fruit juice, coffee and jam. So any of those things would be very much appreciated. Uh, but before we hear from Peter Wenham, we're going to now have our opening song of praise. morning is from uh, Nehemiah chapter 2 and starting at verse 11. I went to Jerusalem and after staying there three days I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night I went out through the valley gate towards the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem which had been broken down 
and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on towards the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through. So I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let's start rebuilding. So they began this good work. But when Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite, and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you're doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. This is the word of the Lord. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you will teach us something that we need to learn today from this passage. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That moonlit recce by Nehemiah of the walls of Jerusalem has been a favourite Bible story of mine for as long as I can remember. And it's history written to be retold in Jewish families and communities. Last week, Peter was talking about God answering Nehemiah's prayers way beyond what he could have expected, even providing a military escort. Nehemiah really did know that the good hand of God was on him and his mission. So what does he do when he arrives in Jerusalem? I think I might have gone straight round to the community leaders and said, hey guys, uh, guess what I've come to do? To sort out the city walls. I've got the backing of King Xerxes, the most powerful ruler in the world. We can have all the wood we need from the king's forest. This is obviously God's work. I'm so excited. Let's go for it. But what does Nehemiah do? Not a lot for three days. Though, from what we know of Nehemiah, I guess some serious fasting and prayer was going on. But then, after dark, he goes out to inspect the extent of the damage. Just him, his horse and a few men on foot and only the moonlight to see by. No one else knows he has gone. And it's a pretty bad picture. The walls are broken down, the gates are reduced to ashes. There is so much rubbish that Nehemiah's horse cannot negotiate it. And only after this recce does Nehemiah get everyone together to tell them what he has in mind. We all know the mess our city Jerusalem is. I've been round and I've seen how bad it is. But let's rebuild the walls of Jerusalem so that we may no longer suffer derision. As the story develops, we see the sort of things that were being said. Sanballat and Tobiah were putting about that God uh, and the city which he had chosen for his special presence were worthless and had been abandoned by God. Nehemiah was concerned about the state of the city, not because he was a signed up patriot, but because he saw that the state of Jerusalem 
damaged God's reputation. I suppose the, at the heart of, of, of Nehemiah's prayers was that prayer that we use, hallowed be your name. God, I want you to be honoured in Jerusalem being restored. And the accusation was that God was no, looking, no longer looking after his people as he promised, either because he didn't care or because he was too weak. For Nehemiah, building Jerusalem was going to show that God was faithful to his repentant people. And he goes on and tells uh, the leaders of the Jews how uh, God has been working uh, in answering Nehemiah's prayers and moving the king to back the mission. And they got the message, let's do it, and enthused each other with God's part in the story, and they geared themselves up to start work. The opposition have their say, they jeer at Nehemiah and threaten him that they'll tell the king that he's planning a revolt. But Nehemiah tells them straight, that what the Jews are about to do is backed by the God of heaven. And as God's servants, they'll get on and do the work. And by the way, in case Sambalat and his friends think otherwise, he reminds them that it's none of their business. It's a great story and a wonderful example of how to carry on a task for God. We've heard how Nehemiah became aware of a need, how he prayed about it for three months, and that when God gave him an opportunity he, to take a first step of faith, he took it, albeit in fear and trembling. But the, as the door opened, he pushed and got what he was asking for, and he got a military escort thrown in for good measure. I was reminded a little bit about uh, of Montrose Court and the recognition that this was an area of the parish which was not being touched. The months of prayer walking that went on and then the opportunity of the hairdresser's shop coming vacant. When Nehemiah arrives in Jerusalem, he takes stock and he gets to know the key people. And then he secretly checks out the scale of the problem. There's no rushing in blind to the difficulties. When at last he talks to the Jewish leaders and people, he tells them it's a big problem. There's a huge amount of rubbish to clear out and a lot of building to do. But he's also able to tell them his story. The story so far of how God has been opening doors for Nehemiah as he's prayed. And he's able to share his confidence in God with them. And they want to be part of this project. It's a great, it's a great lesson in team building. Nehemiah pauses to reflect. So important. Nehemiah looks at the difficulties. So important to listen to others with the gift of critical insight, to see what problems there are and make us look for God-given solutions, or even that the message that we thought was from God was rushing down a blind alley. Nehemiah saw the problems in the light of his journey so far. His belief that God had been with him thus far encouraged him to make the next step, fully aware of the problems, but believing God would provide a way forward. Ours is not a blind faith, but a faith in God who has acted and will act in the future. We can apply it wherever we have decisions to make or plans to develop. Pray, reflect, be realistic about what you have in mind, remember what God has done before, and respond in obedience and faith. Amen. Thank you very much for tuning in for this midweek online. We're going to conclude our time with a final prayer.
Heavenly Father, thank you for all that we've heard today. We do pray, Lord, that you would go ahead of us into the rest of our weeks and lead us by the power of your Holy Spirit. And we do ask, Lord, that everyone that we meet, everything that we do, that we would keep Jesus in the forefront of our minds, showing him to others. And we pray in his name. Amen.